Um, we, Nancy and I went to Hawaii uh, um, for like a week and a half just for rest and relaxation. It was fabulous. And you know, Hawaii, uh, you guys know that, oh, it's great, uh, great weather, great beaches, great water, right? That sort of thing. But they also have um, a lot of hiking trails. And so we've done, we've done several of them. So uh, I decided that I wanted to do a new one uh, this time when we went. And um, I wanted to hike up a, a we went to Oahu, uh, and I wanted to hike up uh, this Mount um, Cocoa Head Crater. And Cocoa Head Crater is, is a trail that goes up a mountain. So here I've got a picture of it. And so um, here's the mountain right there that we that uh, you can you can hike well walk up it okay or hike up it right and Frank's thinking you climb up it no so there's a trail and it's hard to see there's a trail that's r right here that goes up that in this uh, um, this uh, and the reason the reason why I wanted to go up there because at the top they have these spectacular views I heard all about it and I, kind of wanted to see the views and it's a big 360 degree view and that sort of thing and and so um, you know they advised you in terms of being prepared to go hike that thing now I just come through my busy work season and uh, I was not in shape okay and uh, I was wearing my dark blue cargo shorts I had tennis shoes and a dark t-shirt I remember and I had a bottle of wire. I'm not even sure if I put on suntan lotion. And you know, you're supposed to go up there and hike it at like seven in the morning or something like that. And we didn't get started till ten, and it was kind of blazing hot. Okay. So, as a, yeah, a vacation, as if we're totally prepared to do this thing. And this is a straight trail that goes right up the top. The military put it in just before World War II, uh, and they put in a railroad track these railroad ties and railroad tracks to haul up supplies to the top and they built these bunkers at the top and that sort of thing so I thought oh, this this will be a good challenge right and so here is the beginning of it and uh, if you can see um, uh, Nancy right there <laughs> she's hiking with me I, I'm in back taking a picture of her that's her and you can see the start of the railroad. The railroad tries, ties going straight up, and it goes straight up, just like that. And uh, uh, I, I think it's 1,048 steps, and it goes up 1,000 feet in elevation. Now, I found that out afterwards. I, kn I knew it intrinsically, but I found out the actual steps afterwards. That's, wow. And so shortly after this picture, she was looking at that thing going up and saying, uh, I don't think I'm gonna make it. And so she decided to turn around. But I kept going, and because I wanted to get to the top, and so I kept going, and so for instance, the last part of it's pretty steep. Gives you an idea, right? Yeah, you're, you're going. And so, I mean, I, I would go about 25 steps, and I would just have to go off to the side and put my hands on my knees like this, uh, the one time this uh, uh, sweet little Japanese girl came up to me and <laughs> she bent down, looked at me, and she said, you okay? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, but inwardly I'm thinking, can you get me a helicopter? I just need to get out, I need to get out of here. And so I wanted to turn around, but I didn't. So I got to the top. And so you see these views, and here's the top of the bunker, and you see all these views and it's very beautiful up there, okay? That is, that is. And so that's one of the bays that uh, you can snorkel at. But basically, it's just, it's just beautiful. So I was persistent to get up to the top. Now I had to get down, okay, but, but I did. I, I finally made it down and I was a wreck. I was, a, uh, my wife can attest, I, she, she thought I was gonna die, okay? So sometimes I felt like, ah. Oh. But being persistent, so that's what we're going to be talking about is that persistence. And, you know, you've been in those situations, right, where you, you, you might have been in trouble or situations where you just got to hang in there and continue on. 
And that's the idea. Uh -oh. oh. Yeah, well, yeah, you can really see it, right? Okay, so it, the idea is, is being persistent. We're going to talk about the persistent widow, and that's, that's found in Luke chapter 18, okay? It is as where the story goes, Luke chapter 18, as far as the persistent widow goes. And um, I think Jesus tells us this to be persistent in prayer. I mean, that's, that's the whole idea. And, and, and scripture kind of commands us to pray. Um, and the, the Lord, uh, God hears and will answer our prayer. So uh, we have this, uh, we know that there's several scriptures that tell us about prayer. In fact, I've got a couple of them here to give you the background. So for instance, Psalm 55 and verses 16 and 17, he says, uh, but I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan. In other words, he's praying. And by the way, when he says, okay, there we go, now we have light. So when he says evening and morning and noon, by the way, just a co quick comment here, that's how often the Israelites prayed. When somebody asked, well, how, should, how often should you pray? Well, evening and morning and noon. And that's, that's what they did. And because that's, that's where it's coming from. So uh, evening, morning, and noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. So God's hearing our prayers. James 5, 16, therefore uh, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So that's again, God uh, supplies uh, answers to us. Matthew 7. Uh, the verses 7 through 11. Uh, Matthew 7, 7 through 11 says, Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So that's, that's the principle. Now, the last verse I have here is 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It says, this is the confidence that we have toward him that we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. So, it should, that's very clear in terms of, you know, that, that when we ask and go before God in prayer, he's going to be providing answers. And there's many other scriptures besides these. I just selected four of them, but there's lots of them. So, but, you know, we also know that our prayers are not a speedily answered, okay? Um, at least they're not answered on our own timetable, are they? Because, you know, sometimes we'd like God to answer these prayers, and sometimes that's not happening. And for whatever reason, you know, God is all wise. He's all knowing. He's all gracious. He's all right, righteous. But for some unknown reason, unexplained to me or to you, he's not answering. He's, he doesn't seem to appear to be answering us, but yet here he is. He's encouraging us to pray. He's encouraging us to be persistent and continue on in our prayers. And that's what we have here in this parable in Luke chapter 18. We have the parable of the persistent widow, and it illustrates the praying in faith and not losing heart is, is what that is. So the, the story itself, simply about this widow, this woman, who simply will not give up asking for justice. I mean, she continually is seeking justice, even though she's arguing in effect, or trying to argue before a, a corrupt and a apathetic judge. Uh, so that's our story. As a matter of fact, let's turn to Luke 18, and we'll read. Uh, it's also, hopefully you, got, you have handouts, right? Good. So it's on your handouts also. So let's, let, let's read through the story. Luke 18. Verse 1, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. 
He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's our parable. That's what we're talking about. So the context is persistence in prayer, not to lose heart, not to give up, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but we find this context going back to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, uh, in verse 20, we find that the Pharisees are talking to Jesus. They ask him this question, and they ask him when, when, uh, when the kingdom of God would come. So the, the Pharisees are asking Jesus this question, when the kingdom of God would come. And uh, I, I think about that. The Pharisees knew the Old Testament. They, they knew scriptures uh, spoke about this. And there's many, many scriptures that speak about when the kingdom, about the kingdom. And so, uh, for instance, uh, one of the ones I wanted to look at is uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33. As a matter of fact, let, let's, if you can turn there, I want to go through this so you can see this in terms of the, the Pharisees' mindset and what they had. So Jeremiah 33, here's an example of, of, of this, and this is just one of many. Um, Jeremiah 33, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, starting verse 1, a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. So he was in prison. Thus says the Lord who made the earth. The Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounds and against the sword. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from his city because of all their evil. Behold, I will bring to it health and healing and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me. And I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. And this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I pro provide for it. And he, he goes on, there's still more. Thus says the Lord, in this place of which you say it is a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Jude and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord of, the host, Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. For a steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of horse, hosts, and this place that is waste without man or beast, and in all of its cities, there shall again be inhabitants of shepherds resting their flocks. And the cities of the hill country, and the cities of the Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negev, and the land of Benjamin, the the places about Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved 
and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it shall be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. I, this is just, like, amazing, okay? And the Jews, the Pharisees, the Israelites, they knew this. And so when they are asking Jesus about the coming kingdom, I mean, they knew the prophets had told about that there, uh, there would be a successor to David who would sit on the throne forever. And, and they knew this. And they had the expectation of a great national deliverer, the Messiah. That's, that's what their thinking was. They were told that the Messiah would do things like... Uh, uh, rise again, judgment would take place, uh, sins would be wiped clean, enemies of the Jews would be destroyed, they themselves would go on to great health, to, uh, to healing, to, uh, to abundance, to prosperity, to, to protection, to security, all these things. So they were looking at this outward, uh, um, an outward earthly visible kingdom. That's what their mindset was. And, and so here they're asking Jesus this question, when will this kingdom come? And they're not uh, looking at Jesus as the Messiah. He can't be, because after all, we're under the yoke of the Romans here. We're in subjugation to them, and there's still a lot of pain and suffering and that sort of thing. And so he's not the Messiah, so when will the kingdom come? And Jesus, in uh, verse 20 to 21, he tells them uh, that the kingdom of God is in their midst, standing right before their eyes. And they don't like this. I, I personally think that when they heard this, uh, that they turned around and left. Okay? I, thought, I think that they just turned, heard that, they turned around and said, no, well, then the, he, he's not, this is not the kingdom. Okay? can't be in our midst. And so they left. Because in verse 22, uh, Jesus turns to his disciples. He said to his disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And so I think he's, they've left, and he's talking to his disciples. And so that's the background context. In other words, there will be trials and temptations in this evil and sinful world that we have. And that's what's awaited them on the earth. And so I think about that problem of evil and uh, suffering and the need for justice. I mean, that, that plagued the disciples and it plagues us today, doesn't it? Has it changed? It hasn't, has it? it problems for them, problems for, for, for us. We wrestle with those difficulties. And I don't know about you, but we long to see our Savior return. We long to see Jesus come back. I think the same thing for the disciples and for them back then as it is for us. And, and Jesus is telling us before he returns, there's going to be difficulties. But in the meantime, we can know that if we're persistent in prayer, he's going to eventually answer our prayers. That's what I think he's telling us, to be persistent in our prayers. So we have some participants in this, in, in this, uh, in this parable. So that sets the context, uh, chapter 17 going into chapter 18. And the parable, I think, is pretty uh, simple enough to understand, I think. We have an, uh, an unrighteous judge, okay? And we have a widow that's seeking justice. So here's the two. And the fact that it says uh, that the judge said that did not uh, fear God, nor did he respect man, okay? So he's not fearing God nor respecting man in verse 2. And that kind of tells us that, well, he probably wasn't a judge um, appointed by the Pharisees or the religious leaders or, or the leaders of Israel. More like he was a judge appointed by Rome if he didn't have fear of God, okay? So that's your clue to know that, no, this guy's not a... Uh, Jew, he's probably a Gentile judge appointed by, 
by Rome here, okay? And because uh, he didn't follow God's law. And he was completely indifferent to the needs of the people. He didn't care. He didn't have compassion. If it was a Jewish judge, he knew by the law that he should take care of widows. Okay, that's what the Old Testament law said. But this, Jesus calls him in verse 6 an unrighteous judge. So that gives you an in, a clue here. But what's interesting to me is Jesus, you know, he uses this unjust judge really to teach us a, a lesson about prayer. And that's what's really interesting. The other participant, that's that widow, the poor widow. She's introduced in verse 3. And so she apparently is a victim of injustice, and her only recourse here was to seek justice in the courts. But notice a few things uh, about her. She, she didn't have any, uh, of course her husband had died, she was a widow, but she didn't have any relatives or friends uh, to go before her and plead her case. She had to do it herself, says she. During that time, generally, women didn't go before the judges. It was men, okay? And so here, she's going before it. So she didn't have anybody to represent her. It'd be like today, okay, we have women going before court, but generally, don't you get a representation, like an attorney, right? And so, uh, or you should maybe. Um, she didn't have that. No representation what's, whatsoever. Um, I think she had a solid case. And the reason why I say that is because she pleads for justice, doesn't she? She's looking for justice. She's not looking for any type of special circumstances or favors here, okay? Aside from what the law says. She's looking for justice. So I think she's got a good, good case. She's also per persistent, that's very clear, because she keeps coming to the judge over and over again, uh, despite the fact that he's been ignoring her. And then, um, you know, it just appears that some of the injustice that had already been done to her, um, uh, you know, she was desperate for justice. It's like she had nothing to lose, okay? You know, she kept coming, and that, that sort of thing. So that's kind of the background, the setting of this parable, okay? Oftentimes, uh, when you read scripture, you uh, start in a new chapter and you kind of forget what's happened in the last chapter, that sort of thing. And so that's what kind of sets this really is Jesus has been talking about the coming kingdom and then he turns to his disciples and he says that we ought to pray and not lose heart. Do you see that? And we've got these parable that he's given us and he's encouraging us to do this. And he, I think he, there's a whole bunch of contrasts here, and that's what I want to bring up, uh, that there's contrasts. So uh, let's talk about them. I've got four different contrasts, and the, f the first contrast is uh, prayer contrasted with losing heart, okay? That's the very first contrast. Basically, if we don't pray, we're gonna faint. It's as simple as that. That's what he's basically telling us. So the, the word, Lose heart means to give in to evil or to turn coward or to behave badly. Those, those are all examples of what to, to, to give in to evil, to, to turn as a coward away from something or to behave badly. Those are examples of it. And other Bible translations, you might have faint and not to faint. Okay? And so that's another translation. But what, what it's being described here is a believer who uh, loses heart and gets so, so discouraged that he or she wants to quit. That's what it's really describing here, okay? Well, quit what? Quit praying. Context. So in other words, so discouraged you lose heart that you quit praying. Ever, ever had that happen to you? And so that's what that's describing. Instead of quitting, Jesus is saying, no, we need to be persistent in praying, and he goes through the parable, okay? And being persistent in praying, does that mean uh, that we should, okay, 
our, our prayers that re really matter to us, should we be praying those over and over again? Well, we've got to be careful about that because uh, Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 6, I think verses 5 through 15, Matthew 6, 5 through 15, about doing that, praying over and over again and using multiple words, that sort of thing. He wants us to be persistent in, in prayer and to make prayer natural. That's really what he wants us to be. Natural like breathing, right? I mean, do you ever think about breathing? You don't. It just happens. That's how prayer should happen. It should be natural like breathing. You just do it. Okay? And so this, so it should be a natural habit for us. That's, that's that idea of being persistent, not quitting. Okay? I often think, well, prayer is much more than just, you know, the, the words that we give from our lips or, or the thoughts that we have in our heads. Okay? It's really kind of the desire of our hearts. That's, that's to constantly desire, say, Jesus is, is the idea. Even if we never speak a word. Um, the, the verse, the scripture verse up there on 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. And so that's the idea is it's constantly on our hearts. And so we're constantly uh, being persistent in terms of those, those things that we're praying. Not lose heart against fainting while we're here on earth. So that's the, that's the first uh, contrast that I see is that prayer contrasted with losing heart. And, uh, you know, we need to understand persistence. That may be our only weapon that we have while we're here. Uh, the second contrast, number two, good. That's the contrast of the, of, of the widow contrasted with God's people. So here we have the widow uh, versus God's people. And Jesus didn't say um, that God's people are like this woman, this widow. Okay? Rather, I think it's just the opposite. As a matter of fact, there's a whole bunch of contrasts going on here between a believer and this widow. Okay? And so let me go through some of them. I, I think it's kind of instructive for this to look at these. First is uh, the woman was a stranger to the judge. Did, didn't know her. Didn't know who she was. Somebody babbling and, and wanting their case to be heard. That's what, in terms of the judge. And it's a stranger. But, where's, but for believers, we're children of God. We're not a stranger. You know, uh, and God cares for his, his children. So Matthew 7, 11, I have a, a scripture verse up there. And Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, there it is, how much more will your Father who is in heaven get good things to those who ask him? And so that's what we're talking about, is we're not strangers to God, we're children here. The second thing here is uh, the woman had no access to God, meaning that she couldn't um, compel him to hear her case, no matter what she did. And, and the contrast with us is we do have open access to God. We know that. Um, we have access to his presence. We, you know, it, we may come at any time of the day or at any, uh, at any time we need help, we can come before God and bring our request to him. And Hebrews 10 tells us that. Uh, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that's coming before God, by the new and living way, okay? In other words, not by the temple anymore, but by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, he said, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, we can come before God. We have open access to him. Whereas uh, prior to Christ's first coming, people brought their their petitions and requests to the temple and uh, 
it wasn't as open in that sense. Okay, the third, third contrast I see here is uh, the, certainly the woman's a widow, no husband, but no relative, as I mentioned before, a friend to get her case heard. All can see, so, so all she could do, um, I kind of picture the, 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 the judge sitting in a, a, a tent, not probably, probably not a building, probably a tent, and uh, with a courtyard of some sort, and she probably was there either just on the edge of the tent or in the courtyard uh, trying to get her case heard. Okay, and so uh, all she could do is wait outside. She maybe, maybe she shouted at the judge. I don't know what exactly was said, but she's not getting her. There's nobody representing her and getting her case heard, um, and that's contrasted with believers. Okay, so when believers pray, we have uh, the Holy Spirit and we have Jesus. Okay, and I, I have two scripture verses in Romans. And so what happens here is uh, Jesus is our advocate, yes. But the Holy Spirit takes us by our, when we pray by our hand to present us to uh, Jesus and God in heaven, okay? That's what's happening here. Uh, Romans 8.27 says, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, and so it's as if the Holy Spirit's grabbing us and taking us before the throne of God, okay? That's kind of the picture I wanna give you of what's happening. Nobody's taking that woman, okay? But the Holy Spirit takes us. And more than that, Romans 8, 34. Uh, and this Jesus, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Okay, and so that's what we have. And that's a huge contrast to what this woman had. Okay, fourth thing is, uh, the woman had no promises that she could claim to the judge. Nothing to use to convince him uh, to hear her case uh, or anything like that. So she couldn't, there's nothing that she can bring before other than the fact that she thought uh, there's injustice done to me. And that's it. But believers have promises, don't they? See, we have promises that, that's found in his word. So 2 Peter, for instance, is one of many places. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, his divine powers granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. It's one of our partner verses, okay? But verse four, by which he has granted to us his precious, precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So we've got these precious promises, okay? And, and that's what we have as contrasted with the widow. And then finally, the widow had to go uh, to a court of law pleading out of her poverty. She had to go before that judge, okay? whereas we get to go before the throne of grace. And that's the difference there. Uh, having all of God's riches available to us, that's that verse in Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's the idea. We have all of that available to us, unlike this widow. So I think we're in a far, wouldn't you say we're in a far better position than the widow? Yeah. And I think Jesus wants us to, to be aware of that. Look, uh, things may get really tough, but you're in a far better position than the, than the widow. So we, we need to be obedient. We need to seek, as we seek to be obedient, we need to kind of put off. Uh, uh, God will not put off giving us the things that we're gonna be requesting of him, okay? So that's that second contrast. The third contrast is uh, the judge. The judge contrasted with God the Father, and uh, you know God is not like this judge. God is all knowing. He's all caring. He's all loving. He's attentive to uh, our uh, cry for help. He's generous in his gifts. He's concerned about our needs. That's that's God uh, compared to the judge. And the judge, well, he's unrighteous, 
the only reason why the judge helped this widow in this case uh, was because he was afraid she might beat him down. Okay? Now, um, Frank asked me a great, you know, said our question. He said, are you going to be talking about this, this beat, beat him down, what that means? You know what that phrase, fr phrase means? Because Frank knows. He, he brought it up. It's giving someone a black eye. That's what that phrase means. Yeah, giving someone a be beat, to beat someone down is to give some, in other words, to ruin his reputation. Okay? That's the idea there, and that's what he was concerned about. Okay? And that's a contrast with God who answers our, uh, our prayers for his glory. Oh, quite a bit different. And for our good, yes. So what a contrast between the two type of thing. And, and this kind of brings up, at this point, I kind of want to deal with this. It brings up a question. Um, maybe you're thinking about it. I don't know. I thought about this. If God ans uh, answers prayers to his elect, and it says that in verse, in verse 7, it says, and, and will not give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? In other words, he's going to answer your prayers. So it says that in verse 7. And, uh, and if God answers prayers speedily, because that's what it says in verse 8, I tell you, he'll give justice to them speedily. Right? Then how do we explain delays and answers? I mean, that's, that was going through my mind. How, how do you explain delays and answers to prayers, okay? And, um, you know, have, I, I would think that you guys have prayed for something and the answer hasn't come. Or, um, you know, as, as if, um, I, I don't know, it just hasn't, hasn't happened. And, you know, but, but for God, the way I explain this, the way I've thought about this is it's not due to inactivity on his part. It's just doing to preparation, to getting things together. Okay? In other words, your prayer is not um, just solely about you. It's about his glory and doing good everywhere. Do you understand that? Okay? And so your prayer has an effect. So, for instance, I pray uh, for salvation for my daughters. And so both of, them are, both of them are like prodigal sons. They heard the Word of God uh, daily. Through, after our meal, we would read God's Word and talk about it. You could say, yeah, they went to a, a Christian school. Okay. Uh, went to church regularly with us attended Sunday school, just like you're in here now, and they chose to walk away from that and not be a part of it. And that just, you know, breaks our heart type of thing. And I'm saying, uh, I'm wondering, what, why are you delaying? Why don't say them now? Don't you desire them to be saved? Well, the bigger picture is, is God's not inactive in this. He's actively working in this, this area, and he's preparing the ground for that. And it may be us, it may be somebody else that ha plays a part in this. And that's what we have to understand, is, is uh, his delays are delays in preparation. And he's causing all things to work together for his good, okay, and for our good. Romans 8.28 tells us that. And Romans 8.28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Okay? And that's the idea. And so I have to be somewhat patient in that, but yet be persistent in bringing that prayer before him. That's what it is. And so that's, the, uh, I'm going to be faithful to pray for my daughters. And many other prayers like that. that that's exactly what it is. So um, God's, God delays so that all should come to repentance and be saved. And that's that 2 Peter 3.9. Um, I had uh, um, uh, an illustration of that. Is, uh, 
as a church, we went out uh, to talk to people about the gospel, and uh, it was that uh, Saturday whereby uh, we went downtown Huntington Beach, and we had the plane on the banner, God saves, right? Jesus saves, remember that? Okay. And so uh, um, my wife and I uh, ended up talking to this lady who was one of the street vendors, and she was setting up, and we started talking about the gospel, and she was willing to listen uh, to it. And then she asked this question about, uh, she, well, she, the way she phrased it, she says, you know, one of the things I have a hard problem with, uh, she wasn't a believer at all, but one of the things I have a hard problem with is um, how come, um, you, know, uh, you know, you say God's gonna come back soon and all that stuff and we should believe in God, and, but yet it hasn't happened. I mean, there's been, hasn't there been thousands and thousands of years since Jesus? And yeah. And so my wife started going back through Genesis and finally I, I, she got maybe, you know, a half a minute into it and I said, wait a second, wait, wait, wait. I said, no, that's not really it. I said, um, you know, have you ever considered the fact that, uh, you know, God's allowing you to be here and hasn't judged you right now because he wants to save you. And same thing for all these other people. And she said, no, I, I haven't thought about that. I said, you know, God's God. And he said that he's going to come back and judge. Right? And uh, that judgment is not going to be uh, real fun for a lot of people. And yet he's held off so that you could hear the gospel message and respond type of thing. And that's how gracious of God he really is. And that's why we've gone through this whole time period and you say, well, he's not coming back and nothing's happened. Well, in fact, he is gracious enough to hold off type of thing. And that's that idea of 2 Peter uh, 3, 3, 9, and where it talks about he's, he's not slow to fulfill his promise, but it's patient not wishing that anybody should perish. And so that's what we're, we, we gave to her. Now, she didn't respond still. She just took that in and, and that's how we ended up ultimately leaving that type of thing. But that's how God works, okay? So the moment we, we request a, a prayer is the moment God begins to work. But again, he's working in preparing everything to bring everything together and to bring ultimately people into his kingdom to save them, type of thing. So, okay, so uh, let's go on to the, the final contrast I wanted to bring up, number four, there it is. And uh, our prayer request contrasted with praying for Jesus to return. And uh, the, the, you know, this parable is told um, uh, while the theme of, in the context of the theme of Jesus' second coming, it's still fresh in the mind of the disciples, of the believers, the listeners. And so we mentioned that in Luke 17. And Jesus basically is teaching us as we wait his return, he wants us, you know, to keep praying to not lose heart. And so <clears throat> we call this a, uh, uh, an escalate, escalate, Theological prayer, or an in, big word, in times prayer, okay, is what we would call this. And it's an encouragement for us to pray that the Lord will come soon, okay, and to pray for strength to endure while, while we're here. That's really what we're talking about, okay? And so um, a, a, I have a verse up here that really summarizes really well, I think, is what he's talking about. And it's in Luke 21, thir verse 36. That verse says, but stay awake at all times. In other words, while we're here on earth, stay awake at all times praying that you have, what? Strength to escape all the things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay? And so that's a good way to put it. This is saying, look, pray for that strength now you know, before he comes. And by the way, pray that he would come so that people will get saved and then uh, we will be ushered into eternity. 
Um, you know, at the end of this parable, he says something in verse 8 um, that kind of seems maybe out of place. You're not quite sure. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, this is uh, uh, Luke 18, verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So, you know, why is he saying that? Um, when Jesus comes, will he find us praying faithfully? Ah, that's what he's asking. You know, and persistently. Will he find his people perse persevering and being persistent in prayer and expectation? Will they lose heart? He wasn't questioning whether all believers would be gone when he returns. He's not questioning that. He's saying, look, are, am, when he returns, are people going to be praying for his return? Are people going to be praying while we're here on, on earth? Okay? And I thought about this. I think there's way too many people who maybe they call themselves Christians or believers. Okay, not totally sure about that. But I think that they're going to be totally unprepared for his return. And um, maybe not totally eager for him to come a second time. Why? I think that they're too enthralled in the life of this world, the life here on earth. They were too enmeshed into worldly values and the things of the world. In other words, you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do today? I'm going to do this and this and this. It has nothing to do with <coughs> God and Jesus. And they're enthralled in that. And I, th I, that thought goes over and over, and I have to ask myself, you know, uh, am I praying for Jesus' return here? Am I praying that people will get saved? And am I part of that? Am I going to be involved in that? Do I long for his appearing? And by the way, uh, we haven't had it so hard in our country. Maybe those times are coming. Whereas in other parts of the world, it's been very rough for them. But not for us so much. When those times come, am I going to lose heart? What's going to happen? James 5, uh, 7 and 8 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so again, that's a call for us, really, to be persistently uh, uh, coming before the Lord and praying to that effect, praying for his return, not only just to be vindicated if there's been injustice put to you, he certainly will punish sinners. He certainly is going to uh, dethrone Satan. He's going to establish his righteous kingdom when he comes. He's going to bring an everlasting priest. He's going to do all this. And it's all going to be for his glory, you know, for him to come and reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And so I have to ask myself that question. Am I persistent in my prayer. And that's what this parable teaches us, to be persistently coming before him, knowing that this time that we have really is going to be short. Okay? That sort of thing. And so am I praying for Jesus' to return today? Will I be, will I be, will I persist in, in faith? Will I be ready and waiting for his return? It's an encouragement for all of us. Are you doing that? We all should be doing that.